Jenny Gray actually began her career in civil engineering, in transportation as well, and it was followed by a banking career in South Africa. But she also had a lifelong love of animals, and she followed that lifelong love and became CEO of Johannesburg Zoo. And then, that wasn't enough. So she had to cross the Indian Ocean and come to Melbourne, where she is now the CEO of Zoos Victoria. And she spent a decade fighting extinction, and she went to the University of Melbourne to undertake a PhD. And the thesis that she wrote became a book on zoo ethics. When she's not at work, there's another animal that she sort of kind of loves, bulldogs of a particular variety, Western bulldogs. <laughs> That didn't get as much of a cheer, so I take it that not everyone is a Bulldog supporter in the room. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a few, but I think you know having a team means that you're well and truly a Melbourneian now, aren't you? <laughs> She's also an obsessive scuba diver, and you would have to be, because she loves it so much. She's brave waters of temperatures one to two degrees Celsius. Um, to dive in the waters of the Antarctica, where she's come face to face with a four metre leopard seal. So, very fascinating, interesting person. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jenny Gray. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, that's long. Um, Welcome, and, and in starting, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land we gather on. And I'd also like to pay my respect to the generations of conservationists who come before me, um, people who have really done so much to set up the, the milestones and the foundations for what we're able to keep doing. And today, I'm going to talk about our journey, a decade in conservation. You see, I kind of figure if Bill Bryson can do a short history of everything in one medium-sized book, then I can do a short decade of fighting extinction in one medium-sized talk. <laughs> but I've got to promise you, my staff are amazing, and they've done so much work that this is going to be a really fast, high-powered journey through fighting extinction, because there's a lot to cover. So stay with me. Our journey started in 2009, where we were really thinking about what zoos should be and could be into the future. And as we were pondering that, a crisis emerged on Christmas Island for this very small insectivorous bat. And we were part of a rescue mission. Ourselves, Taronga Zoo and Perth Zoo sent a team over to help save this. The wonderful Lindy Lumsden had been measuring these bats over years and years, plotting the points, and you could see that we were going to lose them in 2009. And so in February 2009, the government put out a tender. That consortium of zoos was the only tenderer. We finally, after all our negotiations, put a team on the ground in August 2009. And when they put recording devices across the entire known habitat of this bat, we recorded one bat flying, just one. I'm going to play for you now the recording made on the 26th of August 2009, the last bat on the last night. You know, 10 years on, it still evokes an emotional response. This thought of listening to the last individual of a species before it disappears. This thought that we arrived too late. And maybe if we hadn't argued so long, maybe if we'd listened to Lindy sooner, maybe we would have got there in time to do something. But we couldn't. And so Zeus Victoria decided that would no longer be our role. We're not going to show up in time to record extinctions. Instead, we're going to convert to being a zoo-based conservation organization. And what that means is convert to making sure that each one of the people that work for us, wherever they work in our organization, is a conservationist. And that we do our conservation work each and every day in and through our zoos. And that led us to developing a model that said, well, how do we do that? In the whole world of conservation, we're just one tiny player. What can we really do that makes an impact? What skills do we have? And we identified two key skills. One, we, work with critically we can work with critically endangered animals. We know how to hold animals and breed animals. We've been doing that for 156 years now. And the second thing is we can talk to people. Every year, two and a half million people come through our gates. We can help them make decisions that make a difference for wildlife. 
And so those are the two core premises we've been working on for the last decade. And we're doing this because we know, as you all know, that nature enriches our lives. That when you see a possum run across the deck, you all have a moment of something special just happen. When a butterfly lands on your nose, you know where you belong in the world. And so what have we been doing with field conservation? Well, our board was particularly brave. Back in 2009, they made this commitment that no Victorian terrestrial vertebrate species will go extinct on our watch. It was a big claim, and it made us terrified for a little while. I was really excited about three years ago after a visit to Zoos Victoria that the San Diego Global, the San Diego Zoo, they've made the promise that no Southern Californian terrestrial vertebrate species will go extinct. You know you're doing the right thing when the San Diego Zoo starts copying you. <laughs> so what does that mean? What was involved? Well, our scientists identified 20, and we added one more during the decade, to give us 21 critically endangered species that if we do nothing will simply disappear will go extinct on our watch. We now hold and work with 16 of those in our care, 17 of them. And the others, we're doing an incredible amount of research and habitat work because we don't believe that this is about putting animals in zoos. We believe this is about animals safe in the wild. And I'm going to talk to you today just quickly about five of them that we're working really hard on with many of the partners in the room because if you gave me four hours, Vic, I could talk about all 21. But today, I'm going to have to choose a few key highlights just to talk about what we're doing. And to start with Eastern Barred Bandicoots, and thank you, that was already introduced. This is our success story. This is our flagship program where we've been working incredibly hard with a number of partners. And they say success has many fathers. You can see at the bottom, we have many fathers of this program. You only save a species working with an incredible team of people. And right across the room, I can see faces of people who've been helping us make this happen. In terms of the success from 2009, we only had two wild populations in Victoria. We now have five. In terms of the definition, and wild is a little bit in brackets for the first one, because if they're inside a fence, we don't count them as wild in Victoria. And so those two populations, while they were existing, they were inside fences, and as such, the population wasn't called wild, and they were presumed extinct in the wild. We have been working on that and releasing them back in the wild, and now the population estimate is somewhere between 780 and 1,000 animals back in the wild. The captive population remains the same, but we also have expanded the number of institutions. Now, how did we do that? Again, if I had four hours, this would be a fun talk. I'm not going to go through all the cool stuff. I'm going to pull out a few of the cool stuff. Some of the cool stuff we've done is working with the partners at Phillip Island, where they've made areas fox-proof, we're able to put bandicoots. And so they're on Churchill Island and they're on Phillip Island. An incredible step forward for us. Nigel and his team at both Tiverton and Mount Rothwell are amazing partners and completely committed to the species. And we've tried fun things like guardian dogs and gene widening trials. I know we're winning when people have to put up road signs because there's so many bandicoots you can run them down. <laughs> That's what winning looks like. And this is what not winning looks like. Not winning looks like foxes and foxes and foxes. And at all times, we have to be really aware of the absolute destruction of foxes. And sometimes kangaroos and red tape make this harder than it needs to be. But what's coming next is equally exciting. We have five new sites that we think will come online in the next 18 months, including three where guardian dogs are going to be deployed in the wild saving species. This is an incredible breakthrough, and working with Nigel and his team is leading the way in showing ways we can protect bandicoots without fences. And if we get this right, it will be an absolute game changer. OK, that was bandicoots in three minutes. Now let's do a helmeted honey eaters. Yay, thank you. <laughs> and in particular, again, noting a huge team of people working. And helmeted honey eaters, while the numbers are low, it is an incredible success story because the line I draw your attention to is the wild population estimate. It's gone from 50 to over 200. That's a success. And we're not out of the woods yet, but we're definitely on the right trajectory. And what we've done here, again, a ton of things, and I can only point out some of the cool ones in the time available. I stopped dead the other day when I found a woman doing egg post-mortems. So you go, what? The egg died? How did that happen? But really what happens is when an egg doesn't hatch, 
she comes in and looks at why the egg didn't make it the way through. Because at the moment in our helmeted honey eaters in captivity, about 50% of the eggs don't hatch. And she's helping us crack that. And if we get that right and get up to 100%, oh, I, no, I didn't, that was terrible. Oh. Right, we do like a good pun, but I didn't see that one coming. We've also done predator awareness training, which is helping the birds as they leave be aware of what the dangers are. And just teaching them that, we've turned the survival rate to first year from somewhere around 50% to well over 90%. And then finally, our real shout out to Haining Farm, because the big challenge with the species is getting more habitat online. And so Belinda is here, Lawson, the work on Haining Farm is opening up new habitat where we'll be able to release lead beater possums and helmeted honey eaters. And just an incredible piece of work with partners there. And so we've seen enormous revegetation happening. The two million trees in Victoria and 20 million trees for the Australian government, and there again, Brendan's team are just absolutely amazing, rolling trees out to make space for these animals to live in the future. And the bad stuff is just that, a lack of place to release them. And so as we grow our numbers and we're starting to get the breeding right, what we need more than anything else is more places to put these birds. And of course, when you're down to such small numbers, watching genetic quality. Orange-bellied parrots, another story that's really exciting and really sad. We're not winning all of our fights. Orange-bellied parrots in the wild, we're losing this one. We're down to less than 50 birds in the wild. We've been able to boost the captive population, which is an insurance population, but there's not a lot that tells us the species is going in the right direction, and it urgently needs help wherever it can get it. And it even needs help. These little parrots, they migrate from Tasmania to Victoria every year. It's a really long way and a lot get lost. So this year we invested, and for the next couple of years, we've invested in what we call assisted migration. Everyone else calls that jet star. <laughs> it makes flying much easier. And I was delighted to hear that after we had moved the animals back from Werribee back down to Tasmania this year, one of the wild birds showed up at the Wurrubi Open Range Zoo and sat on the aviary. He obviously heard there's an easier way of getting back to Tasmania. <laughs> Lord, our island stick insects. The wild population was unknown in 2009. We were really venturing into the unknown with a captive population and breeding these guys. We now know the still an unknown around the wild population, but we have up to 1,000 adult Lord Howe Island stick insects in our care, and 15,000 eggs. We're just ready and waiting for the day when this beautiful island is rat-free, and so that we can see not just Lord Howe Island stick insects, but a whole lot of other really cool animals like skinks and cockroaches back on the island. I'm not so sure the people that live there are as excited as we are. <laughs> but what's really cool with this is a project done by the Lord Howe Island Board, where they have ramped up their volunteer and conservation tourism where you can go and take a package which includes working with scientists, listening to speeches every night, and getting involved at night. Instead of sitting around drinking on this beautiful island, you can go out and do real conservation work at night. It's an incredibly exciting project there. And finally, one that's really dear to my heart is the Bobo frog. Back in 2009, we thought they were in trouble, but we didn't have any idea how bad trouble they were. Over the 10 years, we've seen this population crash and they're well under 1,000. We've upped the captive population, but there's all kinds of problems for these frogs. And it's really sad going out into the wild and sitting with researchers who take their holidays. There's an amazing man called Jet Black. It took me about two months to work out that wasn't his real name. <laughs> but he comes out every year and surveys for bobo frogs. He says it's like going home and finding that your friends have left, one after the other. He goes to places where there used to be hundreds of frogs calling, and now those little gullies are quiet. And so this is an incredibly important project, and one that the Victorian government has been instrumental in supporting under the title of Little Brown Things. You can see why. But really an important project. The important thing for bobo frogs is it's all about water. They have to have water to live in. And what we're realizing more and more is that when we open up forests, we mess with the hydrology. And even sites just downstream for roads, we now find the oil runoff impregnates the water and has detrimental effects to frogs. And what happens below the cutoff line of forests, so logging further down the mountain, 
often ends up in draining the swampy ground that these guys really need. But we have some rescue on hand as well. Detecting these frogs is incredibly difficult for where they live. And so we've engaged the help and noses of some pretty special dogs. And detection dogs are doing a great job helping us identify more bobo frog habitats and more bobo frogs. And so that's what we're doing on the one half, on what we're doing with animals. And it's an incredibly exciting story with some wins and some work still to be done. The other half of what we've been doing is how we engage with people how we instill in them that absolute love and awe of animals. A few years back, a colleague of ours, not this one, but um, <laughs> a colleague of ours said, zoos don't do anything useful for education and behavior change. Everyone would be better off on Saturday staying home and watching David Attenborough. Now, much as I love David Attenborough, you can imagine that annoyed us a little bit. But what it also, we stopped and reflected and said, maybe they're right. Maybe we haven't done enough research. And so what we've done over the last decade is we've done a lot of research into the ways we can engage with people. And we've published papers, and we have over 14 published papers now. All the things I'm going to show you do have references, and if anyone's interested, we can give you the published papers. So that when I tell you we can do things, that I'm going to show you tons of stats in the next five minutes, or 10 minutes, um, we can back it all up with science that's been done by many people in the room and many of the universities that you're all familiar with. So what have we been doing? Well, first of all, we tried to see, can zoos really elicit a strong emotive reaction? And the wonderful Liam Smith wired people up to a whole lot of medical devices and looked at heart rates, temperatures, flushing, all kinds of things that happened, and was able to prove quite categorically that when people see animals doing amazing things, they have a deep physical reaction to that, that it does elicit both an emotional and a physical reaction. Through their calling on you, we tested the concept of whether we were able to get people to take an action based on whether they were asked by a keeper or whether they just came across a sign at the exit. We found keeper talks were far more influential. If you think of that one keeper talk, 28% of the people who listen to that talk send in a mobile phone for recycling. And while the sign at exit looks low at 4%, remember the sign's always there, the keeper's not always there. So while the percentages are lower, the number of phones that came back from the signage was much higher in total. And so our learning out of this study is we have to do both. We have to do keeper talks and we have to have signs. Then we got into a lot of fun. We started with Wife for Wildlife. That's all around using toilet paper made from, we used to say recycled toilet paper, but no one wants to do that. <laughs> so it's toilet paper made from recycled paper. Um, and rolling this campaign out, it's been really fantastic. We engaged the services of Crap Man. <laughs> that, that was a lesson in not letting your staff do things you don't know. Because when they came to me and said, we've got, this, we've got Crap Man, we're going to be rolling him out. I went, I'm not going to the board saying we're hiring Crap Man. <laughs> and then they went, but we've already got the suit. <laughs> so... And he was a huge hit. He has been replaced by Superman, who still has a chip on his shoulder that Crapman was more popular. <laughs> but Crapman did his job. He convinced people. In fact, in one year, we convinced 35,000 households to switch to recycled toilet paper. And this campaign's now been running for eight years, and we've seen an enormous shift in the demand for toilet paper made from recycled paper. <laughs> We asked the question, can we anthropomorphize? Because so many of those animals I showed you at the beginning are small and cryptic and brown and really hard to get people engaged with. And so we made cartoon characters and we tested them. And this is a lovely study and I could take hours on it, but the simple answer was yes. Kids absolutely engage with the cartoon characters. And not only engage, we can get a change of behavior. And so in our shops, we tested whether people were prepared to pay more for a sustainable product if they'd been through our experience. And again, the results speak for themselves. When they'd been exposed to the experience, 82% bought the more expensive postcard with the FSC label, and if they hadn't, 45% bought it. That is a huge change in behavior on buying, and we, we made the card more expensive. It was $1.50 with FSC and $1 without. People are still prepared to pay if they know it goes to the right reasons. Don't Palm Us Off in Palm Oil is our longest running and biggest campaign we've been running. We've done the research over and over, and we can show that not only did people change their understandings and behaviors, but that we were able to empower a citizen social movement. 
We've had over half a million actions taken by kids, by adults, by everyone about palm oil. And we now have 95% of the population of Australia saying we want mandatory labeling of palm oil on our foodstuffs. We then took a breath and said, wow, if we're doing all this stuff, are we starting to really annoy our visitors? You know, they just came out for a good day out, and now they feel like they wandered into an educational experience. And so we asked the question of, when do we become a nag? When do we make it so everyone's just going, ah, stop doing that, please, just leave us alone, it's getting crazy. <laughs> and you know, we took this really seriously because many of the, you in the room know Rachel Lowry, who's now gone to WWF. When La Rachel Lowry says, let's do something, she really means it. And so we took 10 different behaviors at Melbourne Zoo, we rolled them out three times a day, there were 30 opportunities that people would bump into one of these campaigns where we talked about all the different things you could do to be environmentally sustainable. And what we found was we could not reach the threshold. In fact, people enjoyed their day more because we had all of those activations than they did when we didn't have them, with one exception. And that was when you ask for money, you can only ask once. But for everything else, you can ask as many times as you like. So I'm just warning you, there will be just one ask in that, no. <laughs> Um, and what should we ask? They gave us some really clear guidelines on how we can ask and what kind of actions people are willing to do while they're in the zoo. We then said, okay, but that was nice, that was lots of different actions. What if we only have one action and we ask that as many times as you can? And so Rachel took hold of Werribee Open Range Zoo and we plastered it with the Bees for Wildlife message. It was on t-shirts, toilet doors, menus, in the restaurant, on the bus, every keeper talk, every enclosure, everywhere. Do you think we got close to pissing people off? <laughs> nah. Still improved the experience. And for me, even more staggering was 30% of people left saying, what campaign? <laughs> it's... We've done work with marine plastics and with Seal the Loop. And we've been able to show here that the SEAL show is incredibly important in giving people new information. They pay more attention when there's an animal in front of them and there's an emotive connection to them. And this is incredibly important when you think of how much work and effort goes into presenting shows. We've been able to show that the shows are more influential than the exhibit on its own. And we took that back out saying, oh, it's all well and good. We interview the people who are already in the zoo. We actually went out onto piers and interviewed people on piers to see if they knew anything about our campaigns and were using the tangler bins. And again, they had heard of our campaigns at the zoo and they were using the bins. Next question, so it works in Australia. Will it work anywhere else? We found it works in Africa as well. And using exactly the same model, we were able to show changes in attitudes and beliefs and behaviors in Kenya. We've had a few that didn't go as well as we liked. Our Love Your Locals campaign was one where we went out and tried to get everyone to fall in love with all those critically endangered creatures. And after two years of solid work, less than 5% of visitors could name many of these species. So we decided, well, if they can't identify them because they're all so little, we'll make them really big. <laughs> really big. And so over summer, we had a really big campaign with corroboree frogs, and what we've seen is a 27% increase in ability to identify a corroboree frog. <laughs> I'm still worried about the other guys, right? Like, how would you miss that? <laughs> Last year, there was some research done looking at visitors' values and environmental learning outcomes by Roy Ballantyne, and he showed some really interesting things. He showed that the model we're using actually is backed up by his science as well, so independently he's come up with exactly the same model. But the other thing he found, which I think is incredibly interesting, is that regular zoo visitors are extremely high in universalism and in benevolence. Now, I would love to claim that's because of us, but it may be that we just attract people who are very high in universalism and benevolence. But the exciting thing about that is these are exactly the people that we all want to encourage to join us in the conservation movement. These are exactly the people who are already primed for the messages we're putting out there, as well as some of those who aren't. We've also tested this through our education programs. It does work. Kids learn, and they learn a lot more when they're engaging with the animals. And then we've taken all of these learnings and we've put them into the campaigns we're now running. 
And I'm going to share with you quickly the balloons and their attachments, this campaign. I journeyed to Lord Howe Island thinking I was there to talk about insects and in fact saw in their museum the impact that plastic was having on the sheer water chicks. These little birds are starving with their stomachs full of plastic right here in our water from our plastic. And the third most recognizable item, you can see the items there that come out of the chicks' stomachs, the round ones, the little ones that look like clothes pegs, those are balloon attachments. It's attachments from our balloons that ends up in the ocean that the sheer waters pick up and feed to their chicks. And so this led us to a very simple campaign that says don't release balloons outdoors. And we would love to see balloons banned across the country. Sorry, not balloons banned. That's really fun police stuff. Uh, <laughs> the release of balloons outdoors is what we'd like to see banned and replaced with something as innocuous as blowing bubbles. And kids love blowing bubbles. And so this campaign's a lot of fun. This is a bubbleologist. So <laughs> next time you hear one of those futurists say, there's careers you've never heard of, <laughs> there you go, bubbleologist. Um, and we get people to make visible commitments. We're also doing work again with Phillip Island, measuring the biological impact, and we're working with the amazing scientists on Lord Howe Island to look at whether we can see a noticeable reduction in plastic in chicks as a result of this campaign. And it's going so viral. We see schools that used to release balloons every year on the first day of spring. I don't even want to ask why. But they now blow bubbles. We had the MCG full of people trying to blow bubbles to beat a Guinness Book of Records, and we would have got it if it hadn't been 42 degrees. <laughs> the universe was trying to tell us something that day as well. And we couldn't have done it without all of our absolutely amazing research programs. We work with universities right across the country, and this emerging social science around behavior change and around what conservationists can do to engage the broader community is incredibly important. We put it into all our campaigns, and I'd also draw attention to our most recent one, which is Safe Cats, Safe Wildlife, where we're working with the RSPCA on our shared passion for cats big and small and how we can all live better. And the result of 10 years is over 1.3 million actions across all of those campaigns. We have had so many people getting behind our campaigns. It really is quite humbling. And we're going to expand. We're getting quests and requiries all the time from other zoos and from other entities in terms of how we can roll out this thinking right across the world. And that's what we'll be doing in the next year. So, I've talked fast. I don't know how I'm doing on time. But anyway, I've got to the conclusion. So, after all that, a decade of fighting extinction, I've got three lessons to share with you, three things I've learned. The first one is that fighting extinction is super fun. There's so much great things to be done out there. I got to sit in a bat cave on a pile of guano and waited for the sun to set and watch literally thousands of critically endangered bats come out of a cave. I got to travel to Borneo and help rescue an orangutan from behind somebody's house in an appalling condition. I've got to hold mountain pygmy possums and warm them up as they come out of hibernation in my hand. And I've got to fall in love with wombats. <laughs> my second lesson, and as one Victoria said, is that fighting extinction is a long game. There's few easy and quick wins. We've been at this for decades and decades. We're just a new partner in this, but many others have played for a long time. It takes commitment and it takes supporters and it takes people like the people in this room who spend their whole life committed. And the only thing that makes that easier is science, data, working with the universities, working with the bright young people. Data is our best friend. Data is what, is what will keep us moving forward. Finally, fighting extinction needs teamwork. This is not a game that anyone can play on its own. This is a game for all of us. And so through my decade, I've met incredible people. There's many people here from Zoos Victoria, from our board, from Kate, our chair, um, through board directors. I've met incredible women, and because it's Women's Day, I just put some of you up there. But there are so many amazing people that I've met on this journey. Scientists, politicians, financiers, we all get to do this. Amazing volunteers, people who spend hours and hours of their own personal time engaging 
with communities, rehabilitating habitat, working for species they may never even see. I've met people who are just about as crazy as I am and will hike through forests and up and down swamps in order to see amazing animals. I've met people who give up their holidays to literally sit and have birds vomit on them <laughs> in the name of science. And I've met ordinary people who come out in their thousands to our zoos year in and year out with exactly the same commitment we all have to a planet that's rich in wildlife. I can't think of a better group of people to have shared the last decade with. It's been an absolute ball. And I really look forward to staying the next 10 years fighting extinction with all of you. Thank you very much. so much, Jenny. That was fantastic. And everything she says is true. There is a bat cave only. It's filled with guano, you know, not with high-tech gadgets and a batmobile, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I have actually met a bubbleologist, a professional bubbleologist. I, I met him during National Science Week, but he couldn't seem to tell me anything about the science of the Canberra bubble, so <laughs> never mind. Um, look, I'd now like to invite to the stage um, the Bush Heritage CEO, Heather Campbell, who's going to make a few closing remarks and to um, thank Jenny and present some gifts on behalf of Trust for Nature and Bush Heritage. Um, please welcome to the stage, Heather. How can I follow Jenny? It's just <laughs> impossible. Um, and look, and I can also say that um, I've been really privileged to experience a lot of what Jenny has shared. To see the amazement and joy of faces of kids at the zoo as they engage with animals. To be able to sit out in the wild and actually see helmeted honey eaters. To be at Haining Farm and see the amazing work of, of Greening Australia Parks and the zoo with making an old dairy farm come to new life. Jenny, thank you so much for sharing those amazing stories on what is a fantastic morning here on the land of the people of the Kulin Nation. We are so privileged to be here, to share stories, to connect in with all of us, women and men, with the amazing conservation movement and be able to be part of this. I was asked to just, I suppose, share a, a few little uh, statistics from a Bush Heritage perspective, but we're really proud that two-thirds of our staff are female. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Just like the amazing people at the zoo and at Trust for Nature, we have fantastic people out in the field, whether it be really, really hot and dusty. And when I've set a uh, picture of a temperature of 52.8 degrees, I know, again, yeah, it's a bit hot, um, or in the floods or in the joys of the um, unfortunate fires of Tasmania, that 50% of our field staff are also female out there in those amazing countries protecting the species around Australia. One of the things I was just reflecting on too as Jenny was speaking was our journeys. We all come from an amazing background um, and us engineers are pretty cool people. Um, <laughs> but I'd also like to give a message to those of um, younger members of, of the teams that are here is go with your dreams. I remember as a year 10 year old, sorry, a, a year 10 um, student, a bunch of boys said to me, you can't be an engineer, you're a girl. Now, I, you know, I was a tad of a painful student, so I went, well, well shh, I'll prove it to you guys, I'll show you. Um, and it started that journey and that passion. So, you know, please make sure if somebody says, no, you can't, yes, you can. Believe in yourself and you can make dreams come true. I was also reflecting as a kid growing up in New Zealand and growing up in the bush that I just loved being outside, loved that engagement, and I really wanted to be a park ranger. But I'm, I'm not good with physical fitness. Um, I wasn't the big outdoorsy kid. And so it's now taking me <clears throat> a large number of years <laughs> to get to the point now where I've got that huge privilege to be CEO of an organisation 
with a whole lot of people out there on reserves. I never would have dreamed the journey that I had, but it's been an amazing journey and I just love that interaction with the zoo, with all of my colleagues here in the room. One of the other things is, you know, sometimes you hear a lot of doom and gloom and we've had the challenges of the fire in Tasmania and I know some of our Tasmanian friends are here with us, that we've had the floods in Queensland and the devastation for the pastoralists up there. And our world is changing. And sometimes you can get really depressed. And we have got things like, you know, the, uh, the call, the final call of the, uh, the Pippa Straw at Christmas Island. And every time Jenny plays that, I do burst into tears. But we are amazing human beings. We have skills. If we actually put all of those skills and work together, we can make a difference. Yes, we're probably going to lose a few species, unfortunately, because of where we are but boy, we can save a heck of a lot. And we can protect this amazing planet and we can engage kids and we can actually make them want to love it. So, you know, when I get frustrated with my 10-year-old son who all he wants to do is play bloody Fortnite <laughs> on the computer. <laughs> but he's also a kid that's been inspired by the corroboree frog. And so it was through the zoo that he said, I want to give the money that my grandparents gave me for Christmas to the frog. And that for my birthday, I want all the kids to not give me a present, but to that. Now, that's not my influence. It's the influence of people like Jenny, her team, the zoo, all of us here in the room. So i just like to say a huge thank you to everybody for coming, making this yet another brilliant Women in Conservation breakfast. I'd ask all of you to continue having those amazing chats, to also you know, go away here with that sense of positivity, that we can make a difference if we work together. And for those of you that are just starting out on that work journey, anything's possible, connect in with people here, learn their stories, be inspired by that, and give it a go. Thank you to Jenny, the team at Trust for Nature. Thank you to Sasha at NAB and JB Ware. It feels like actually thanking a whole lot of friends that we've known each other <laughs> for years and we, we all come together. But thank you to everybody and to Tanya for making this an amazing breakfast. All of you as supporters, sponsors, friends, thank you so much. And I think we have a little gift here. Thank you. For, for Jenny. So. Yeah. Thank you. You have to give it to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Am I, I'm getting off the stage. I'll pass back over.